where did the name virgin come from? One of the girls laughed and said, you're a virgin at business. Did she get a finder's fee for that idea or not? <laughs> we began building other companies. The only reason we would go into a new sector is if we felt it was being badly run. Is there something in your life you haven't achieved? We are on the verge of finally fulfilling, fulfilling that dream, a virgin galactic spaceship going to space. Now you were a sir, you were knighted. I was slightly nervous. It would have been a, a, slice, a slice of the head rather than a, um, a, a tap on the shoulder. Would you fix your tie, please? Well, people wouldn't recognize me if my tie was fixed, but okay. <laughs> Just leave it this way. All right. I don't consider myself a journalist. And nobody else would consider myself a journalist. I began to take on the life of being an interviewer, even though I have a day job of running a private equity firm. How do you define leadership? What is it that makes somebody tick? You've written two books. Uh, one is Losing Your Virginity and one is Finding Your Virginity. And in those books, uh, you describe this incredible path, how you've gone from very modest meanings to this great wealth. When you started life, um, you were not a great um, scholar as a young boy because you had dyslexia. When did you realize you had dyslexia and was it a problem for you? Uh, early on? Uh, in conventional um, schooling terms, it was a big problem. I mean, I would sit at the back of the class, look at the, look at the um, blackboard, and it was just a, a jumble. And, um, uh, and, uh, and you, know, the, the, you know, I was thought of as you know, uh, a bit lazy, a bit thick, I mean, you know, um, or a mixture of the two. Um, and um, if I was interested in something, um, I generally excelled. Um, uh, and, um, and what I was interested in was what, what was going on in the world. Um, so the Vietnamese War was going on. There was a, a general sort of 60s sort of up, uprising of students taking place. And um, so I decided to start a magazine to campaign against the things that I thought were wrong in the world, in particular the Vietnamese and War. And this was when you were 15 years old? Yeah. So you dropped out of school at more or less 15 or so, you start the magazine, and as part of the magazine you get interviews with some prominent people, one of whom was Mick Jagger. Or is it hard to get an interview with Mick Jagger when you're 15 years old? Do you know, I think in some ways, if you're 15, uh, uh, you have a better chance of getting interviews with people than if you're you know, 30 or 40 or 50. Um, and you know, I would, uh, I would just turn up at people's houses um, uh, and um, you know, door stop them. And because I was young and, 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 and enthusiastic, they generally took pity on me. Ultimately, you decided to start a record company. Um, where did you get that idea from? And where did the name Virgin come from? Why not Branson? <laughs> um, we were sitting, I was, you know, 15, 16 years old, we were sitting in the basement with a bunch of girls and we were, were throwing out ideas and we got down to either slip disc records um, because of the black vinyls that always had scratches and slipped or, or virgin and one of the girls laughed and said well we're all virgins and you're virgin at business why don't you call it virgin um, and did um, she get a finder's fee for that idea or not <laughs> i can't remember who I, if she's out there she can i'd be delighted to give her one um, but you know but it we, we, um, i mean it, 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 it's very fortunate because we've gone into so many different um, sectors, so many different businesses. We've been a virgin, uh, uh, you know, in all of these different sectors. And um, uh, slip disc airlines uh, would not have Probably been a good. Have worked. <laughs> so you start a record company, and initially it's a record uh, a retailer, right? Yeah, we started. Um, uh, actually, initially it was a mail order, um, selling records much cheaper than anybody else okay. had done. And then, so we we're the first people to sell records at a discount, and then. There was a mail order strike for six weeks, and so we went looking for a, a very, very cheap uh, music store in Oxford Street. Uh, then you start building Virgin mega stores, gigantic stores, and you had a lot of stores uh, in UK and other places. How many did you have at one point? Uh, we had about 300 uh, okay. mega stores around the world in all the, all the main places like Times Square, Champs Elysees, um, uh, Oxford Street. Um, 
uh, at the heyday of when you know of, of when music was really all that young people did. I mean, um, before games, before mobile phones, before all the other things that young but people. The did. success was the Virgin name. Your self promotion of it, or you were selling things cheaper than other people. What was the so Virgin was synonymous with you know music credibility. So Frank Zappa or. Um, uh, the Rolling Stones. I mean, you know, so we had a very credible brand. And you know, w one day um, there was a young artist came to me with a fantastic tape, and I took it to a number of record companies, and they, none of them would put it out. So I thought, screw that. We'll start our own record company, and and um, uh, and uh, and we we put it out on our own record company, and 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 it was called Jubilee Bells by Mike Oldfield, and. It became a great success. So you have a record uh, retailing company and a record production company, and both called Virgin. Yep. Somebody uh, drew, drew a V for you to be your logo. We decided we needed a more, um, a, a slightly hipper looking label, and somebody just came came up with this very simple signature. But then you decide, well, I need to start an airline. Um, where did that idea come from? It came from, uh, I was trying to get from Puerto Rico to the Virgin Islands. I was 28 years old, and I had a lovely lady waiting for me, and um, and you went to the Virgin Islands because you liked the name Virgin, I assume. Right? Uh, exactly, <laughs> and and, um, and that, actually that's true. And um, anyway, American Airlines bumped bumped us, and um, and I wanted I'd been away from this lady for three weeks, so I went to the back of the airport. Uh, I hired a plane. I hoped my credit card wouldn't bounce. Um, I. Um, I uh, got a blackboard, I wrote Virgin Airlines one way, $39 to the BVI, went to all the other people who were bumped, and I filled up my first plane. And, um, and when we landed in the BVI, uh, the passenger next to me said, um, you know, sharpen up the service a bit, and, and um, you could be in the airline business. And, and I thought, okay. So the next day I rang up Boeing and said, uh, do you have any secondhand 747s for sale? We started with one secondhand 747 against British Airways 300 planes and Pan Am and TWA's 300 planes. Um, British Airways launched a, a dirty tricks campaign against us, um, which would, and they did everything they could to drive us out of business. And uh, we took them to court. Um, we won the biggest damages in, in uh, British history. Um, uh, it was Christmas time. We, gave, we distributed it to all our staff. Um, uh, equally, and, and so we, I think every year they hope the British Airways will launch a dirty tricks campaign against us. But people like the fact that you were against the establishment airline, and well, one time I read that you, uh, that the, what's now called the I, I guess it's the big Ferris wheel <laughs> in uh, London, the British Air was supporting it, and they couldn't get it assembled, they couldn't actually get the thing uh, to work, and you rented a, was it a blimp? We actually had a little uh, blimp company just outside right. London, and we scrambled the blimp and we flew over the over the fl eye that was still lying flat on the ground, um, and they, all the world's press were there to watch this eye being erected. And all we said was, you know, BA can't get it up on the side of the airship. So how did the the newspapers were able we, to say we, that? We got we got we got the headlines. They okay. didn't. <laughs> So it, it turned out pretty well, and then you began building other companies. Did you always think that the name Virgin and your creativity could get them off the ground? Well, uh, again, um, the, the only reason we would go into a new sector is if we felt it was being badly run by other people. So the reason we went into trains was the government were running trains. Uh, British Rail was dilapidated trains. Um, you know, a miserable service, and we just felt, um, you know, we could we could go in, we could get fantastic new new rail stock, we could motivate the staff, um, and, and we could make a big difference. And so we took over, you know, the busiest line in Britain, the West Coast Main Line, um, and we've gone from eight million passengers to nearly forty million passengers, and um, and you know, I think transformed the experience for people, um, and. You know, in every in every new sector that we've gone into, we we we've we, we've seen, you know, a gaping gap in the market where the big guys have not been doing it very well, and, the, and where we can come in and sh you know shake up an industry. So, how many companies have you started with the name Virgin? Is it a, a few hundred by now? Uh, it's it's in excess of three hundred. Three hundred, and everyone presumably hasn't worked. So a couple just couldn't have worked. So, did, when you start them and they don't work, you just end them after a year or so, or? Yeah, I mean, um, but none of them have ever been filed for bankruptcy. We've been fortunate that we've never had a bankrupt company, and if something doesn't work out, 
um, we, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we settle all the debts and then move on to the next company. Now you were a sir, you were knighted. Um, did you ever expect to be uh, a member of royalty in effect or knighted? We once put out a record called um, God Save the Queen by the Sex Pistols. I was slightly nervous if she if she'd remembered um, the words on the record that, that you know, it would have been a slice, a slice of the head rather than a, um, a, a tap on the shoulder. Is there something in your life you haven't achieved that you'd like to achieve? <laughs> We've spent 14 years working on, a, on, a, on our space program, um, and it's been tough, and, it's, and, 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 and space, is, space is tough. Um, it is rocket science. And, um, uh, and I, you know, I think we, we're, we, we are on the verge of finally fulfilling, fulfilling that dream. Um, and you know, before the end of the year, I hope, I hope to be you know, sitting in a, um, a Virgin Galactic spaceship going to space. You've got about 200,000 people, or maybe more now, that signed up. Um, are they still there, ready to go? Well, I mean, actually signed up and, and paid up, uh, it's about eight, 800. What does it cost to pay up? It, it's $250,000. You know, I mean, there are, there's about 50% of people watching this program would love to go to space, and, and there's about 50% who think, if, you know, these people are mad, what on earth do they want to go to space for? Um, but the market of people who want to go to space is, is gigantic, and, and um, we, we hope to be able to, um, you know, to satisfy quite a few of those people. Do you think you can make a profit on this in the end, or is it really just a, a love of doing this? So, I, I never go into a venture with the idea of making a profit. You know, if you can create the best in its field, um, generally speaking, you'll find that you'll pay the bills and, and, and you'll make a profit. So the way, as I understand it, works, it's not like a rocket goes off. You have an airplane and attached to it is another airplane, and the one that separates goes into outer space. Is that right? The one that drops will then fire its rocket and you'll go at about naught to 10 seconds. You'll be traveling at 3,000 miles an hour. Uh, in, 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 into space, and, um, and how long would you be in space under the ride that you're talking so, about? So, so the yeah. the whole experience would be something like three hours. So, will you be on the first flight? I'll be on the first official flight. We've first got official. we've got um, okay. you know very brave um, uh, astronauts who, who are effectively test pilots who are uh, you know testing the craft time and time again and, and ironing out you know anything that can go wrong before myself and, and members of the public go on. So I'm sure it'll be safe, but one time when you were doing hot air ballooning, uh, you weren't sure whether you would survive. With the ballooning adventures, I was doing something that, um, that nobody had done before. Uh, I was um, you know, trying to you know, fly across the Atlantic or the Pacific or, or go around the world in, in, a, in a balloon. I was flying at you know, 40,000 feet in, in the jet stream, um, you know, with one, with one other person, Pierre Lindstrand. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the technology was completely unproven. There were, the, we were the test pilots. That was more dangerous. Things could go wrong, and they did go wrong. But you set a number of Guinness World Records for that. But in hindsight, do you have any regrets about taking those risks <laughs> on the hot air balloon? It's interesting. Um, you know, my son and daughter now uh, are, are setting themselves big adventures every year, um, dragging their dad along on some of them. You know, and I think as a family, we feel, you know, live life, live life to its full. And um, and you know, you you can, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can, you can die in a road accident. You can die on a, just a normal bike ride. Um, and quite often, when you're actually completely focused on an adventure, um, the, it's less likely in some way that you're going to die in an adventure because you're, you're, you're ready and sharp and, and know, know how to deal with it. So you're very well recognized for all the things you've done around the world, but also your hair and your goatee are fairly <laughs> well recognized. So uh, did this always have, uh, you had a goatee most of your adult life and your hair is always this length? I've I've been a hippie yep ever since I was um, uh, yeah 15 years old um, and um, uh, and and I've had a beard pretty well ever since I was 15 uh, 16 years old so 
Um, I shaved it off once when we uh, launched a company called Virgin Brides, and I put my put a bride a bridal dress on, and um, and um, and anyway gave gave people a good laugh. And um, we found there weren't any Virgin Brides, so that business didn't succeed for very long. Um, but um, or maybe it was the fact that I. I, I didn't look the most fetching bride. So now you were a sir, you were knighted. Um, did you ever expect to be uh, a member of royalty in effect or knighted? We once put out a record called um, God Save the Queen by the Sex Pistols um, on the Silver Jubilee. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and then I found myself 25 years later being knighted. By, and um, I was slightly nervous if she if she'd remembered um, the words on the record that, that you know, it would have been a, a slice, a slice of the head rather than a, um, a, a tap on the shoulder. But um, she's, she, she was, she, she forgave us anyway. Well, this wasn't done at the Tower of London, I guess. So it, fortunately, uh, it wasn't done in the Tower of London. For those that may not know about Necker Island, uh, as I understand it, in the late 1970s, there was an opportunity to buy an island in the British Virgin Islands. Yeah, I mean, I, they, they wanted. Five million dollars for this beautiful island. Um, I thought I could scrape together about a hundred thousand, so I offered a hundred thousand. Um, nobody else, fortunately, came to see the island. So a year later, they said, if I make it a hundred and twenty thousand, we'd have an island. And I went I went everywhere to borrow, borrow and beg to get that hundred and twenty thousand. And um, and we ended up with the most beautiful um, right. island in the world. So you've built a house there, and there's also a resort. We, I mean, Necker has become, um, it is our home. Uh, it's, um, you know, a magical place. And, you know, we have fantastic um, get-togethers of people, um, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, conferences there where we, we, where we try to, you know, sort, sort out the problems of the world, um, uh, or just people come on holiday and, to, you know, even book the whole island. Barack Obama and Michelle Obama managed to go to Necker Island. He was good enough to um, invite me to uh, the Oval Office for lunch about three months before he stepped down, and we had a lovely lunch. We basically agree with each other on most mo most aspects of life. So I guess he was a nice house guest. Both of them are, and, uh, are absolutely delightful, and uh, you know, and I think uh, you know we we had a, a fun competition. And uh, anyway, he beat me. He 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 learned to kite um, before I could foil board and and. Um, uh, and, you know, they, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it, it, it was a great privilege to spend time with them. Well, many times people who become financially successful and otherwise are well-known, they seem to be unhappy for some reason. I'd be a very sad person if I wasn't a very happy person. Um, I mean, I've, I've been blessed and every day I'm learning, you know, I mean, I didn't, you know, I, I, I see life as the one long university education I never had. I feel like I am a, a, a perpetual student. Of great leaders, you've brought a lot of them together in something called the Elders, which are people like Nelson Mandela and others who were great leaders in their time. And you were very close to Nelson Mandela. Very close. I was very lucky that for, you know, for, for ten years we, we knew each other very well. And you know, so we set up the Elders, which are twelve incredible men and women who go into conflicts and try to resolve conflicts. Um, and if you, you know, conflicts, I think maybe the most important thing because if you have a conflict, everything else breaks down. What is it that makes great leadership in your view? I think uh, be, being, being a really good listener is, is one of the, the key things and I think uh, uh, when, I li when I sit around you know, listening to the elders talk in elders meetings, um, you, know, you, you realize that you know, why they've become elders is because you know, they, they, they've spent their lifetime listening and absorbing and, um, uh, and then you know, only, only speaking you know, you know, choosing their words carefully. Um, I think uh, loving people. I mean, I think um, uh, you know a genuine love of a genuine love of everybody. You know, um, uh, and um, you know, looking for the best in people. I mean, even you know, even if uh, they're they're being a pain, um, you know, you, you can normally find the best in in pretty well anybody. Um, so when you're a business leader, if you're a business leader, somebody's watching this and wants to be Richard Branson or Sir Richard Branson, what is the key? Um, I, uh, surrounding yourself with great people, um, learn, le learning to delegate early on, um, not trying to do everything yourself, um, 
uh, you know, making sure you've got the kind of people that are, are, are praising the team around them, not criticizing the people. Um, uh, um, and, uh, and, you know, ha having people who are willing to, um, you know, to, to really innovate, be bold, and uh, create something which everybody who works for the company can be really proud of. Now, one of the great things about your life is you've had a terrific family life. You've been married for more than 40 years. Uh, where did you meet your wife? I met her in a recording studio uh, called The Manor, in, uh, which is the studio we had in, in the UK. And was it love at first sight? Or? Uh, uh, it was from my point of view. <laughs> it was just, look, she was making a cup of tea. I looked across the room and I was absolutely smitten. And I, I then, had, uh, she was with, with somebody else. So I, had to, I had to, I'm afraid, um, chase her. And um, okay. my nick nickname became Tagalong because a friend who worked at Virgin knew her. And, um, I would ask her if I could tag along when, when she was going out to dinner. Well, it worked out. And you have two children who uh, you're very close to. I always think it's important if somebody successful can, can do this while their parents are alive. And your father died a few years ago, but he lived to be a uh, close 93, to 93. Yeah. 93. Your mother is still alive. What was it like having your parents see your success? Oh, look, it, it was it was wonderful to be, you know, to be able to share it with them. Um, my mum. You know that my first two hundred dollars that I got to start my business, my mum found a necklace and went to the police station, handed it in, and nobody claimed it. And she got, she managed to sell it for two hundred dollars, and that was, you know, that was the critical money that um, helped helped me start. And you know, we, we managed to sort of share, you know, this wonderful wonderful life that I've been lucky enough to lead with with them, and and um, and uh, with my mother, we still do. In the philanthropic world, what would you say is the thing you're most focused on in the philanthropic uh, humanitarian area? We're it's a little bit of a sort of serial uh, philanthropist in the same way that you know we just uh, we were a serial entrepreneur, in, in that I find it difficult saying no to you know projects that I feel are important. But did you ever think when you were growing up that you'd be wealthy enough to give away staggering sums of money? Uh, I certainly, certainly never dreamed that um, that uh, that. You know the, the, the incredible <laughs> dream of my life would 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 have actually happened, um, and that um, uh, and that I would one one day be in a position to to um, make it, you know hopefully make a difference. Well, many times people who become financially successful and otherwise are well known, they seem to be unhappy for some reason. But you seem to be a very happy person, very content. Uh, is that a fair assessment? <laughs> um, I just think I, it, it would be, um, I'd be a very sad person if I wasn't a very happy person. Um, I mean, I've, I've been blessed to have a you know, absolutely lovely, uh, lovely lady. Um, we're complete opposites, but you know, we, we get on great. Um, you know, blessed to you know been together um, most of our lives. Um, blessed to have wonderful children, wonderful grandchildren, and uh, and every day I'm learning. You know, I mean, I didn't. You know, I, I see life as the one long university education I never had. Um, I'm learning something new from you know getting out there, listening to people, and um, and you know I, 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 I scribble everything down, I, and, and 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 I feel like I am a, a, a perpetual student. Well, let me ask you a question. I've asked Bill Gates. Um, do you think you could have been more successful in life if you had a university degree? Obviously, you couldn't be more successful. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I mean, at the age 40, I, I turned to my wife and said, I think I might give everything up and go to university. And, and um, she turned to me and said, you, you just want to go and chat up those young ladies at the university. You go straight back to work. And it, and it was good advice. <laughs>